I like devotionals. Obviously, or I wouldn't be doing them. <laughs> but I like the idea of God using devotionals to speak to us. I like the whole concept that God can use anything He chooses to, and often does, to to inspire us in some way, to conspire around us, to cause us to come to Him in some way to understand what He would say to us and how He would say it. For some of us, He speaks direct. For some of us, He speaks inside in still small voice. Some of us, intellect or intelligence. Some of us, insight. Some of us get by way of however the Holy Spirit chooses to use you. In some way, God inspires you to understand that He's speaking to you. Now. God wants to always bring you farther along so that you would begin to hear his voice and see him face to face. God wants to have relationship with you and he wants to bring you along to the place where you understand that. But until he does, he may work with you in some way that you've limited him because you just can't handle the living God, the holy God, until you're ready and until he's prepared you to deal with him face to face. And so. I like the devotionals for that reason. I was laughing because a friend of mine said recently, well, I never thought of using devotionals, you know, to inspire people. And I thought, why not? <laughs> and I began to realize that because they had this reading plan, they just read the Word of God, you know, through the reading plan, and that was kind of their way of being inspired. Well, I tried that when I was younger. You know, when I was a early born again Christian, you know, I, I was always, you know, influenced by everybody because, you know, I was like a sponge. I took everything in from everybody. And I really didn't have much of a filter of how to, you know, you know, push away a lot of this junk that was out there because, no offense, but if you walk into a Christian bookstore, there's a lot of fluff and stuff that, you know, really is more from HR than it is from, you know, anything that's going to profit you much because it's really just kind of like a bunch of hot air. But, you know, some people like it, so some people use it. But for me, it was more like, wow, you know. After a while, I began to realize there's a lot of junk out there. And a lot of the junk out there, though it's Christian junk, is junk. <laughs> and so, when I was taught to read, you know, from cover to cover, you know, as my part of my devotional life, I started reading and Every time I was like in Genesis or something, I was fine. When I got into Leviticus, I was bored, you know, sort of, you know, I kind of enjoyed it. But then when I got into the prophets, I was kind of condemned, you know. I started feeling really miserable, you know. I started getting moody and, you know, kind of like condemnation on myself and others. You know, I just, I could never quite get the handle on this reading it through, you know, and kind of like going cover to cover. Because I took it personal. So because I took it personal and Jesus was already intimate with me from the moment I got saved, I was kind of like passing the buck, you know, because I really didn't need to do that as much as the way other people were, but I was getting to the place where people wanted to be. So gradually I learned that devotionals was what God inspired me because they were personal, intimate, and real, and they talked about the reality of life and the life I was living with God. And I began to get inspired by them. And the Word of God I used as a way of teaching me, according to His Word, what He had done in the past, as well as what He was doing in the present and what He would probably do in the future. And so, I still study the Word of God, but I don't read it. I mean, I read it, I hear it, because I have these devotionals that I use that are reading the Word out loud, you know, and commentating on it. But I don't read it like some people do as though that were... God speaking to me because sometimes, you know, quite frankly, some of those prophets, you know, they were kind of like, you know, really bad news guys, you know, they were like the bad news bears coming on the scene, you know, and really, it just didn't fit me, even though I was letting kind of like Satan condemn me lots of times in my past. So, I don't know about you, but I kind of enjoy what God has done in me and brought me to the place of my contentment with Him and the balance of scripture reading and devotional and spending time with God personally and intimately in a real way and letting Him do as He chooses to reveal Himself to me. And you know, that's kind of what I enjoy. Have you ever noticed that some people just, you know, they always have bad news, you know, they read the Bible and they just spew out all this bad stuff, 
They never have anything good to say about what God is doing today. They always have something negative. They always have something bad, you know. Oh, even the end of the world, you know what I mean? Me personally, I'm looking forward to the end of the world. I kind of get excited about it that we're living in the last days that Jesus is coming in. You know, I have a lot of joy in looking forward to what's about to happen, you know. All the new stuff that's going to happen, new heaven, new earth, thousand year reign. I mean, all this stuff, I'm really looking forward to living. Now, other people like to tear down other people because of that. And I think, why? Wouldn't you want everybody to get there and be there? So, I don't know about you, but... I choose those things, not the positive aspect of it, because sometimes God wants to tell me something, you know, that's not so nice, and I accept that. But I choose not to be with people that only focus in on tearing down, but those people that build up something too. Because you see, that's where I look at what a person does. A person may tell me that, you know, God has inspired them to be some prophet or some pastor or some elder, deacon, prophet, teacher, minister, whatever they may be. And I say, okay, fine. You know, whatever man chooses to talk to God about, you know, and God tells them that, well, hey, you know, you go do it. You know, you know, if the God if God is telling you to do that, you do it. Hey, you know, and within your box, you know, of what you realize God being and doing in your life, you know, hey, God's will be done, you know, in your life. But if you're trying to tell me something, then I have to look at it in a different way. I have to start beginning to examine it according to Scripture. And then if it's any good for me, you know, because I usually look at the person that's telling me something and I say, well, if you're telling me something negative, I want to see what you're putting on the positive side also, you know, kind of balance the scales. Because we're told that the Lord's scales are always a just balance. We're also told that, you know, I look at a man that destructs better also be construct. In other words, he ought to be telling about salvation as much as he's telling about condemnation if he's only condemning. If he's out there preaching hellfire and brimstone, he better also be building up the body of believers that get saved. Because no man is like one-sided of just, he gets to get away with just condemning everyone and thinking he's being used by God. No, he's venting his own frustration is what he's doing. So, I choose on purpose, by design, Spurgeon has one of them, of my devotionals to inspire me in the right way I should go. Because if it was left up to me, believe me, I could just as easily get caught up in all these emotions that people have over what they read in the Bible, or what they take out of context, or what they feel like at the moment that they feel it is right for them in their own eyes. But when I read devotionals, or when I begin to study as my habit is to share with you and share with myself and have God inspire me through these devotionals, then I begin to realize that God is speaking to me personally. God is intimate to me knowing that I'm going to be in that devotional at that moment in time. And so he uses it, and he chooses to use it in a way that would speak to me today so that I would be inspired to turn my attention and my focus to him in what it is that he is saying through those devotionals that he speaks to me. And so that's why I really enjoy Spurgeon so much so because he says, you know, often to men of God and ministers that he was speaking to in his college of theology that was to train up pastors and teachers and ministers and prophets and Pat and elders and deacon to whatever it is that the people would become, he was teaching them how to be those. And so I like and find, you know, even though sometimes the language may be a little bit unusual, I find great joy in having God use him to speak to me today. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a full drought. Luke 5.4 we learn from this narrative the necessity of human agency. The drought of fishes was his boat, nor his fishing tackle were ignored. Oh, wait a minute. The drought of fishes was his... Okay, the drought, or the catching of fish. Catching of fishes was miraculous, yet neither the fisherman nor his boat nor his fishing tackle were ignored, but all were used to capture the fishes. So in the saving of souls, God works by means. And while the present economy of grace shall stand, 
God will be pleased by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. When God works without instruments, doubtless he is glorified, but he has himself selected the plan of instrumentality as being that which he is most magnified in the earth. Means of themselves are utterly unavailing. Master, we have toiled all night and we have taken nothing. What was the reason of this? Were they not fishermen plying their special calling? Verily, they were no raw hands or no new recruits. They understood the work. They were master craftsmen at their trade. Had they gone about the toil unskillfully? No. Had they lacked industry? No. They had toiled. Had they lacked perseverance? No. They had toiled all the night. Was there a deficiency of fish in the sea? Certainly not. For as soon as the master came, they swam to the net in shoals. What then is the reason? Is it because there is no power in the means of themselves apart from the presence of Jesus? Without him, we can do nothing. But with Jesus, we can do all things. Christ's presence confers success. Jesus sat at Peter's boat, and his will, by a mysterious influence, drew the fish to the net. When Jesus is lifted up in his church, his presence is the church's power. It is not the church itself. It is not the minister. It is not the power of the worship that goes on inside the congregation. It is not the congregation. It is not the people, nor the power, nor the presence, nor the building itself, but it is Jesus in the midst of them. His presence is the church's power. The shout of a king is in the midst of her. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Let us go out this morning on our work of soul fishing, looking up in faith and around us in solemn anxiety. Let us toil till night comes, and when we shall not labor in vain, for he who bids us to let down the net will fill it with fishes. I like that, because you know it reminds me of the priority of not focusing in on the circumstances of life like some do today in politics or in pressures or in issues that they think they need to get involved in, but rather the issue of what God's calling has always been to lift Jesus up and to have him direct us in our lives, that today we should have God in our midst, that God should be in us and God should be with us. For when God is in us and with us, and we lift up the name of Jesus, we lift up Jesus himself as a person real and alive and living inside of us and doing the things that he would choose to do, then men and women are drawn to us. And then we have something to share. Then we have something to care about that lasts longer than a local election or a national selection process with which we choose our leaders and decide whom we would have Lord over us. But in the eternity of God's economy, we could be filling our time with those disciples that would choose to follow the way we would go if we would but lift up the name of Jesus and follow him in all we do and say and be more about the gospel and lifting Jesus up than about the prosperity or the convergence of I was going to say, convergence of contiguous conflict. <laughs> but rather than the conflict of men that often cause division and strife, because they are more about what's life than what's eternity. They don't care about eternal life as much as they say they do. Otherwise, they would change the focus of their attention onto the things of the kingdom and seek first his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto them. But that's what we have to make a conscious choice to do. To put Jesus in the midst of all our conversation. To put Jesus in the midst of all of our life. To put Jesus as the reality of who we are, what we are, and how we live our life. Because if we do, then all men, Jesus said, would be drawn unto him.